Welcome, welcome, welcome to another segment of Conversate and Elevate. Today, I have a very, very amazing guest, a special guest. I know you're going to hear me say that 26 times, but some of the guests that I have, we definitely have a relationship. We have history, and I actually know um, have insight on their journey. So I know that it is absolutely special for you to hear and to understand and get those nuggets. So today, who do I have? Today I have the amazing Duran Jones. I mean, he is a writer, a producer, a director, and an all around creative. And we're going to kind of go through his story because it's not just he ended up right there, but there's actually a journey to get there. I mean, who ever heard the question, um, when did you fall in love with hip hop? Yeah, right? So you get that question, right? You know that you just have that, that core, that essence of creativity and just being in touch. So we're going to really talk about him because a very, very, very colorful uh, individual. So Durant, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, favored, um, exalted, happy, e everything, you know, just uh, I think I, I always tell myself when I answer this question to always think about the question I ask myself, which is if everything stopped today, would you be happy with what you're doing? Ooh. And as long as that answer is yes, I'm, I'm, I'm always good. So, so yeah, I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Listen, that's deep. At least I'm going to take that for myself and uh, listeners, <laughs> you should take it for yourself as well and viewers. So we should have individuals listening to this on all major streaming platforms, but you also know that you can view these, this interview, and I highly encourage the conversate and elevate um, segments. I encourage you to view them, and then you can go back and listen again because we give you so much information that you're not going to get it the first time. So the first time, view it, see who these amazing guests are. Then you can go back and listen it to it on any major streaming platform, your favorite one. But conversate and elevate, you need to sit down, look at their eyes, look into, look at their body language and their facial expression because we're really <laughs> going to dig deep into this. So. The ram, the ram. So let's, I want to go back a little bit um, before we even get into this writing, producing, all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You're an individual that started in hip hop, correct? correct? Correct. All right. So what is that? I mean, you still, do you still do that? I know when we worked together, you still was doing both. And I had the, the absolute honor and privilege uh, to be present during one of your shootings. We'll get into that later. Um, a very <laughs> emotional, um, transitional uh, shooting that you did for a, a video. But are you still into hip hop? If not, can you just talk about what that looked like in your journey of being in a hip hop? I am. It's it's now. It's. I said this to my a friend of mine named Adric. Um, he he always texts me like he when he's listening to like some of my old music and you know even some new stuff like he'll always just send me stuff and he asked me yesterday like why did I stop mm. and I really had to think about that question because I haven't really stopped I just I, I haven't been pursuing it in the same way I, I did when I was a younger man like it was it was like that was everything you know everything went into the albums and I was trying to get on tours and open up for people and do all those things and I really pivoted from that because I think what I felt in music that I was bringing for the place that I was and what I was trying to do and the level of quality that I wanted to inject into it, I wasn't able to garner the ears that I wanted to garner, right? Without doing some of the more sensational things online or, um, you know, really doing things that weren't me in order to get that attention. And mm -hmm. I'm not one to seek attention, but I'm also one that I want people to appreciate the art that I'm putting out. But at a certain point, it was just like, I couldn't, I couldn't find those people, right? And I think even at the time when you and I met, when I did that video, I started to realize that the fan base that I was looking for was changing, right? Um, my last couple of shows, I wasn't even doing the me and a DJ thing, right? I had a band behind me. So that meant I had to pay for each individual, each musician that showed up for my show. And I might only have like 15, 20 people and those 15, 20 people would love it. You know what I'm saying? But the money that I had to put into it to do what I needed to do for people to enjoy it, 
it just wasn't matching up for where I was. And I had to figure out ways to to really pivot. So I, I still do music, but I like it more, you know, loungy, speak easy, like me and an acoustic guitar. And I'm just going to where you can really hear what I'm saying. You know, um, my music has just been different like that for a long time. And I think I, I had tried when I was younger to get myself to fit into a box. And now I'm not any longer there. Like I'm not in that place where I'm trying to get people to uh, to listen to me or hear me. I just do what I like to do, you know? And if you like it, great. If you, if you never hear it, that's fine too, you know? Um, and I think that that freedom is what allowed me to, um, as you were saying earlier, figure out ways to leverage um, these other traits and these other qualities I have, but still keep myself true in a musical form. So I want to go back to, okay, so we're going to drill down on something you just said. Um, mm -hmm. That is really important. And I talked about this um, previously. I actually talk about it a lot, but in one of the previous interviews, kind of, I brought this up. And as an artist who actually experienced this, now I want to bring this back up, not just from somebody who sees it and understands it mm -hmm. happened. I want to nail in what you just said. You're definitely still... I mean, because you are hip hop. That's what people, one people understand too. It's not something that you just go out of. It's something that becomes your core and your essence. So that's always going to be a part of you. But you had to pivot, you said, because not because you wanted to. You realize that staying in it the way that you wanted to stay in it, you were going to have to make some sacrifices to, you know, like you said, sensationalizing, uh, you know, moving in direction of, creating something that's not rest necessarily coming from the heart, but coming from trying to keep a fan base or moving with the fan base. Mm -hmm. And I said that before is like, a lot of times we will say stuff um, culturally, um, you know, watch what you're singing about, you're, you're degrading women, or mm -hmm. why are mm -hmm. you singing about, you know, these drugs or this or the car and the money, like, so we will put that out there and we'll pull people down. But at the same time, when you have those that come out and do conscious rap, educational rap, or just pure rap, whatever you want to put it. And it's not, it doesn't have those things that sensationalize. We don't support them. We say one thing, but we don't support them. As you stated too, you gave the real, like you bring in bands, you bring in like that yeah. true, true music. And you see 20 people out there and I get what people have to start and you build up, but people eventually see you. And unless you're saying yeah. something that they want to hear, which obviously is an opposition of what we say we truly want to hear and how we want to change our culture to speak uh, life into ourselves. You, you weren't getting the support that mm -hmm. you needed in order to move forward like that. I mean, I call it the death effect. I want to hear your opinion on this, but I call it the death effect. I think it's, of Nipsey, right? It's yeah. Yeah. But even Nipsey understood that. Right. And it's, it's, you understand that, the the industry has never been about quality in terms of music, right? But it's I about get the product, industry, Duran. Not the culture, right? I get the industry. I'm talking about our people. We we become but we, that's, us. But people are trained by the industry, right? People are trained as consumers. So if you've been trained that this musical genre that you love is actually a product for you to buy and sell, you're yes. trained it trained based off of the branding of a larger machine yes. and you may not even realize it. So what's happening now, like a lot of times in music, why you see, um, you know, the DJ academics and you see the blog post and everything pop up and it's sensationalized and it's talking about this beat with this person and this with that person, this one slept with this one baby mama and this one doing this over here. Like you see all of that and that is a part of the branding because what it's not actually leveraging is not the quality of the music. Right. It's leveraging your atten attention, right? It's the same thing now. Like we, we've we got streaming, right? And now they got what you call streaming wars. The reason why, you know, Kanye at a certain point was like, oh, I'm gonna do seven song albums, right? I'm gonna do seven song albums. Those seven song albums are maybe 25 minutes, right. if that, right? So you've only got 25 minutes worth of streams which affects your re revenue, deeply impacts your revenue. But now you've got, he's about to do two albums in like six months. Yes, absolutely. Right? With about 20 something songs on it. Why? Because I need to leverage your attention. Your attention, the longer you stay on this platform listening to me, the more money I make. 
right? right? The more I'm able to feed my family. So instead of Drake doing a curated 10 to 12 song album, he do 17 or six, 16 or 17 because he knows he can leverage your attention for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't like every song, you're going to listen to it at least once. Right. Right. And that's more minutes, more streams, more revenue. And that's how I get paid. I get paid off of the minutes now. It's right. not about the quality of the music and what you like and what you're talking about. It's not about any of that. It's about leveraging attention. And I just wasn't in that place where I wanted to crank out music like that. I don't work like that as an artist. My stuff is about how do I feel? What's going on in the world? What am I talking about? I can't, I, I'm not gonna just go in the studio and go in the studio. Like I have friends that used to say um, as a rapper, oh, you gotta write every day. My inspiration doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? Like, and I only wanna write, I wanna write when I'm inspired, not because I have to when it becomes a job. You know what I'm saying? That's when the love for it is not pure. And, and what I'm trying to say is it's unfocused. It's without intention. And I never wanted to be that person. So when I felt that I would have to do that in order to keep up and get where I wanted to, it was time to pivot. And see, but what I want is, to, and, and I totally agree with you on this, but the point I want us to get out of this, those exactly to what you said to your point is, the industry does create all industries. This is not just music, whatever mm -hmm. industries mm -hmm. um, we, we're talking about, propaganda, we're talking about media, creates a lot of things of how we see ourselves and how we operate. But what we have to cure ourselves from the disease is mm -hmm. if we're going to be conditioned one way, we're conditioned and not fight or put these other things out to bully or pull down certain people because you're the one who's conditioned by the industry to have mm -hmm. these individuals do those very exact things that you're attacking them for doing. You're the one conditioned to have these yeah. women, you know, saying, listen, I have to leverage attention. So I'm going to strip down. You're saying, why don't these women put more clothes on and you don't have to act like this, or you're going after certain artists and mm -hmm. bullying them when you feel a certain way, but you're the one who are the consumer, the consumer who's buying into the uh, narrative of the industry. So I just want us to pay attention as consumers when we're looking at artists and creatives and we're attacking them, that we're the ones who have to recondition our mind and go up against something that we're conditioned on. It's not just the artists. Yeah. A lot of artists yeah. would come out here and sing differently, look differently and do differently if we weren't so conditioned as consumers. So I wanted to pull that out because you said you had to pivot no, because sure. you had 20 people sitting when you could have had 200 if we really pay attention to we're the ones conditioned and uh, yeah. Yeah. forcing us to pivot. But you brought up another good point. You took a different path. And that's a, something I want to hammer into. You just said, you know, someone instructed you, you know, crank out, crank out, crank out, crank out. And for you, that didn't work because it may, made you go into a creative space of non-intention. So yours look different. So for different people it may look different, but yeah. When you didn't do it that way, did you see a difference? Is this why you started segueing into film or what did that, what does that look like? Is that yeah, I mean, when I, I, I've always operated in terms of creation with intention, right? Like with, with what do I want to say to people? What do I want people to take away from it? Right. I don't, I don't just want you to listen to my music because you bought it. Like, I want you to listen to it because you're getting something from it, you know, whether it's a message or um, me curating a feeling that you want to have, or even illustrating a feeling that you've had, you know, those are the, the things that I always strive to do. So, I mean, yeah, it looked, it looked a lot different. It looked, it looked like, um, albums that were focused and strategic, right? I think when I changed my name from an older rap name to, to just taking my original name, it was the mark of me becoming truthful with myself, right? And who I was. So the first album that I dropped on, under that name was Wine and White Tees, right? And it was literally me going through this moment of leaving a corporate job that I had, taking an internship for no money and not using my college degree and writing music in my room. And I will always write with a cheap bottle of wine and a white t-shirt on in my room and I will record on my own. So I just called it wine and white tea. So it was like this sophistication, but this every man type of um, storytelling, right? Almost, almost kind of like Bruce Springsteen-ish, 
you know. Um, and then from that, it I, I got on this whole campaign about, um, you know, reaching for the stars, and and it was stargazers, and that that gave me um, symbolism that I wanted people to follow, like chasing your dreams and all those other things, and then the messaging changed there. The first album out of that was Stargazers. It was called The Preamble. It was a mixtape to get you ready for Stargazers, the album. And then Stargazers, the album dropped. And then I transitioned to Black Magic. And it's like the process kept evolving. You know, who I was becoming and what I wanted to say was evolving with every cycle that I was going through. And that is not something that you can keep up with at the time that I was doing this, right? Because I started my independent hip hop career in 2007 when I graduated college, right? Um, 2008, I dropped my first album. After that, 2011, 2012 is when Wine and White Tees came out. Or 20, yeah, 2010, probably about 2010. And then Stargazers, the pre preamble was 2011, 2012. And then subsequent years after that. So it took me about a year to a year and a half to create projects that I felt like I wanted the world to have, you know? And that's a slow process because you're, you're thinking about 2007, 2008, Drake came out with So Far Gone, right? This is off the height of Lil Wayne doing about 10 mixtapes a year when I was in college. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everybody was cranking out beats on Fruity Loops. Like everything was moving fast, 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 fast. That was the ringtone era. Right, where artists weren't even getting paid off of streams like that because it wasn't really a thing yet. You know, they were getting paid off a of ringtone, so they had to pivot. And then it was shows, and it was like, all right, we got to move, we got to move, we got to move because the bags are out here and they're drying up because the labels aren't buying anything. Right, this is the blog era where you had to have an RSS feed right. and people had to be able to follow you, and blogs had to post you and repost you and repost you. Those were the new curations, the new gatekeepers. I can't keep up with that not in the way that I create, you know? Um, so it's like a year goes by, a year and a half goes by, and I'm I'm working on another project, but they didn't forgot about the one I dropped last year. Right. You see what I'm saying? And, and if you don't have the money to really work the songs, if you're an everyman like I was, you bartending, waiting tables and doing all that, you don't have the money to put behind marketing to really be able to feed the machine to keep your stuff in rotation that way. You know what I mean? So that people don't forget about you. So the only thing you can leverage is Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all those platforms, which are really just garnered towards you getting people's attention. And a lot of that, when you look at your favorite artist's feed, it's not about their music at all. Yeah. It's a funny video. It's a beef with this person. It's me trying to say something on a live feed that's going to get 100,000 people in here and, and the shade room is going to repost it and this person's going to repost it. I'm not playing that game. Like, I just, I can't. Right. I can't. It's not in me to do that. You know what I mean? So I, I had to, I really wrestled with that for a long time, you know, and I, I tried to keep up. I tried to keep up, but it just, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. But what it sound like to me, the reason why you said you couldn't play that game, and a lot of people are in that position. Um, there's going to be plenty of people who watch or listen to this who say, man, I'm in that position. It's just so hard to play that game. But what mm -hmm. I'm hearing mm -hmm. and what you just said on how you were able to respect and tap into you not being able to play that game, though, is that you you naturally, either naturally or from people that you're around, I don't know, had... The business side of you, though, because everything you just said, if we pull out, you talked yeah. about strategy, right? Because when we're mm -hmm. creative, we just think about creating whatever you're in. When you're an athlete, you just think about competing. But you're speaking mm -hmm. of other things. You just spoke about I had a strategy. So you were strategic. You talked about this internship you took where it was paying no money. So you talk about sacrifice. There's things that you got to put mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. in positions. You talked about evolution and all of what you just said. You talked about that you have to evolve. You can't you know, you didn't stay in one place. You paid attention to how things were changing, what your message was, the message was changing, your vision was changing, mm -hmm. and you constantly mm -hmm. evolved. Then you also talked about patience, that timing was everything. You know, you knew that you had to take the time. All of that comes out of, out of being a creative. That, that now is literally, yeah. you yeah. creative is the, the vision, the art you have, but that stuff you're talking about is business. So you were able to walk away or do it differently 
and take that leap because you talked about all these things that are ingrained in you. So I, that's what I'm hearing. That yeah. is a huge yeah. difference. It's, it's, it's love. You know what I mean? It's, it's the love of, of the craft. Like I, I, I got into hip hop when I was in elementary school, my stepbrother used to freestyle in the car. And I thought it was the coolest shit in the world. Like we would throw random words at him as we were driving by stuff and he would just string them together and make these witty punchlines. And I'm like, damn, I want to do that. <laughs> like, so I secretly started like writing rhymes on my own when I was like 10, 11 years old. And then that just kept evolving, evolving, evolving into me uh, saying, okay, uh, I'm going to write this rhyme and I, I want to do this to sound like Jay-Z. And I'm 10, 11, I'm talking about shit that I don't have no business talking about. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like most of us do. And what I realized when I got to college was I had developed because I had mimicked myself or mimicked so many other people's styles. I had developed a style of my own, but I hadn't figured out what it was that I wanted to say. So I spent so much time in isolation or in lucubration as I will call it. Okay. And... <laughs> I spent so much time with myself figuring out what it was that I wanted to say that I had trained myself to always say something, right? It was no longer like doing the lunch table wraps just for fun. Okay. That side had gone for me. So everything was about purpose and intention mm. and I couldn't pull away from that because I had trained myself so, so many years just to focus on what it is you're trying to say. What are you trying to convey? So by the time people started shifting, it's like, man, I don't want to hear all that. Just put on a nice beat and you know, let me dance. I'm like, I don't, I don't do that. You know what I mean? Like I grew up on Nas. I grew up on Reasonable Doubt. Like right. I grew up on cannabis. Like right. I was in, in in the Black Planet rooms, uh, battling people on the internet. You know what I'm saying? Like it, that I was on SOHH.com. Like everything was about what you were saying. And I had been trained in that way. So it's almost like you giving a soldier a, a nine millimeter and being like, all right, you fighting on the ground. And then one day, all of a sudden you give him a sniper rifle and you're like, all right, go up there. It's like, wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm in this hand to hand combat. That's not, I don't do that. Like I can't, my skill set doesn't transfer to that. You know what I mean? So I just had to, I had to stick to my guns and I had to um, really realize that. But to go to your point about taking that internship, I think that was the one time in my life that I really, the, the, the phrase, uh, don't worry about plan B plan when plan A's intention is to work. Exactly. Like I, I, I just, I told a job that, Hey, I'm, I'm going to take a sabbatical for a little bit. Would you mind paying out my vacation? you know, for, for this eight week process, I'm going to, you know, go over here for eight weeks, intern with them, and then I'll come right back. And they had told me, sure. And then two days before I took the internship or uh, two days after I had accepted the internship, two days before I was about to start, they basically told me, Hey, we can't pay you out. You haven't accrued enough. So, um, you know, unfortunately we're not going to be able to honor that. And I was like, all right, well, this is my last day. And my mother was like, you crazy. Like, why would you leave this job with healthcare, with all these things? You got this degree, you're using the degree, you're, you're in the field that you studied in. And I'm just like, it doesn't matter to me. It's not what I want to do, you know? Um, and I left and, and I just grinded it out. And I was like, I'm going to have to figure it out for eight weeks, you know? And that's what I did. I figured out how to hustle. I figured out, you know, what jobs I could work part-time and, you know, how I could make some extra money quick. And I just figured all those things out and I soaked up game. And what I got out of that internship was, I never forget it. Um, it was at Patchwork Studios and Zaytoven had this beat maker competition. And the, uh, the head of the marketing internship that I was in snuck me into the studio to be able to listen to the producers because he knew I rap. And one of the producers I met, his name was Keys. And Keys, for people who don't know, they probably do know him now. Um, he's one half of AO and Keys who made Cardi B's WAP. And that was the first producer I met in that internship. And we worked together for years after that, you know? And this was when they were on the cusp. But like, I remember Keys was apprenticing with Polo the Don. And like, we were, he would throw me beat packs and I would just create, 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 create. 
And then I'd put some of them out. Other ones, you know, he'd be like, oh, man, I sold it to this person. And I couldn't put it out. And, and we just worked that way. You know, he did whatever he could for me. But we were both young and didn't realize what the business was. And um, by the time I figured that out, he was already on another on another path, another wavelength, you know? Um, so it was like, I've always had this feeling of being on the cusp, like being right there. But what I realized as I got older is that wasn't what was for me. All of that time that I spent with music, learning how to do merchandise, learning how to um, market myself, learning how to promote shows and um, create content, find videographers to make music videos, do music video treatments, direct my own videos, write my own stuff, crowdfunding, all of that stuff is producing, yeah. which is what I ultimately ended up doing in film. You know, um, so it was just taking a love and taking a passion and that love and passion was training me for something else that I was actually supposed to be doing. Nice. And I love how you said, I mean, because the one thing I want to point out, the nugget in there is a lot of times we won't do stuff because we just jump on what we say all the time. I ain't doing nothing unless I get paid. I ain't accepting this unless yeah. I get paid. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Compensation yeah. can be green. Compensation could be knowledge. Compensation could be access. Conversation, you mm -hmm. compensated by getting some type of return that you don't have. You're investing mm -hmm. your time mm -hmm. to get back something you don't have. And you got back, you got access, you got knowledge, you got the things that you need to do. So I think what's really important for anyone in these industries, depending on what level, aspects your level. If you feel like you have access and you feel like you absolutely have that knowledge and that thing, then yeah, go and have that discussion about the green. But if you don't look at the whole situation and be compensated in whatever way that will help you go to the next level, like you just said, yeah. it it helped you yeah. to even clear the waters of um, evolving. So you mentioned your undergrad degree. So that was broadcast journalism. So what was your intentions yeah. with that? And because and, you said that's where you was at. Well, I mean, because you still can use that, though, from even from the conversation yeah. you're having now. Yeah. But go ahead. Was, yeah, I mean, even that was about leverage, right? Um I, I remember I, I was in AP classes in high school. I took AP Lit, AP Stats, you know, AP World History, like all of that. And I, I've always been one to leverage for some reason. It's just how my brain works, right? The only reason I took those AP classes is because I figured out because of the weighted grade scale, if you got a B, you got credit for an A, which inflates your GPA. And I'm like, well, I know I ain't getting less than a C in any right. class. It don't matter what it is. Like, <laughs> I'm not getting less than a C. So that means if I get all C's, that means I got all B's. Man, shoot, let me go ahead and sign up for every AP class I can. You know what I mean? Like, and by the time I graduated high school with a 3.7 GPA because of that weighted scale, you know? And, and it was just, it was, that was always my thinking, right? And I think um, when I got to college, well, I, I told my mother I didn't want to go to college. I was going to go to a broadcasting institute because at the time, this was 2003 when I graduated. Um, Ludacris was on the radio and yeah. like his songs had started popping. And I was like, oh, I can do that. Like I can, I'm making music already. I know that's what I want to do. I can just get my own radio show and then start playing my own stuff. Like that's how I thought it worked, right? Cause he had done it. And right. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna get my DJ handle. I'm gonna get on, I'm gonna get on a night radio joint. I'll start spinning my own stuff and meeting these people over here. And then I'll just do that. And went to a broadcasting institute that was supposed to be a six month program and realized that <laughs> the place where I was supposed to take these classes was a funeral home that was converted into a broadcasting institute. And I was like, yeah, nah, something ain't right about this. <laughs> hey, Ma, uh, can we go on them college tours real quick so I can figure out what this is? So got to Hampton University. And, you know, they, we're, they're taking us around campus. I'm a young man. It's the campus is on the water. You know, our tour guide is taking me around here, dude. He's like, hey, man, you know the ratio here, 13 to 1. I'm like, the ratio for what? He said women to men. I said, oh, say, say less. Sign me up. 13 yeah. to 1? Yeah. What? Yeah. Man, I'm coming here. Saw the waterfront. You know, we, we meeting all the little girls on the tour. I see the freshman dorms. I'm seeing the upperclassmen dorms. The girls walking by. Everybody fly. And I'm like, this is a whole different world. And it's all Black people. I ain't never seen this many Black people from different areas ever. Like, I met a Black person from Minnesota when I was going to school. I'm like, I ain't know they had <laughs> us out here. 
like this is this is crazy you know my whole world expanded so you know once i got to realize that the scripps howard school of journalism had a radio station my brain was like i can have the best of everything i can make music here these are my people i can start you know promoting my music here and i could be on the radio and figure this whole thing out while not having to and make my mom happy right because my mom had me at 18 she never got the chance to go to college so me even saying to her that i didn't want to go was like what what are you what are you talking about like i've always planned you've been in ap and honors classes since what do you mean you're not going to college <laughs> you know what i mean right and um so i took that leap and when i graduated with a journalism degree it's like, all right, what else can I do with journalism? And they're like, well, you can go work for a news station. Like you, you've done really, really well for yourself here. You got great GPA. Where do you want to work? My mind went directly to Atlanta. Atlanta was bubbling, bubbling with music. That's where everything was starting to pivot towards down south. That's where Ludacris' career started. I'm following that mindset again. So I get a job at CNN and I start going to open mics. So I would literally work from five in the morning to 2 p.m., um, the early morning shift. And then because I wasn't making a whole lot of money, I had to work two to 10 p.m. on the late shift. And at 10 p.m., I would take off my slacks, throw on some jeans, untuck my shirt, loosen up my tie, and then hop on stage with a pair of chucks every night until about 2 a.m. And then I would wake up five o'clock in the morning again, do it all over. And I did that for at least three years Yes. before I hopped out on this internship. So I had always been conditioned that, you know, my purpose was to create something. I didn't know what it was or, or what form or shape it was going to take, but I, I, I knew what I could do in those moments, you know? Well, you do know, one thing you did know that you have um, always said is that you want to create something, whatever that platform is, but you wanted to do it um, in a way where you were telling our stories our way for us. And so whether it was in your music and you want to be true to whatever the message is, like you said, intention and purpose, and now mm -hmm. moving into film, which you tell our stories our way um, for us. And um, you went to, what is the AFI, the American what, I, film, Fine Arts? Yes, yeah, American um, Film Institute. Okay, for yeah. conservatory or something like that, AFI conservatory? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you went there yeah. and so we talk about continue to get education, continue to get knowledge. You get it from, as you just said in the beginning, Nas, Jay-Z, you bring up all the people that ludicrous, yeah. you're following, yeah. you're, you're, you're actually adopting these mentors and, you know, things to, you know, be a sponge and absorb from. You're looking at education. So what I want people to hear too is you may not have opportunity to go to college or college may not just be your thing, but yeah. Yeah. life is education. This is the platform. This is the best school. And so I'm hearing sure. you take advantage of all of the platforms. So now moving into the film and you telling our stories our way. And you know what? And like you said, broadcast journalism, you, you don't know where it's going to go. I mean, you're still... To me, you're journalists, writers, people that tell stuff yeah. like yeah. You, you still are doing that. But um, so into film, what did that look like when you fully stepped into film industry? It was it was it was crazy um, just because I had done it without realizing it. Right. Mm. Um, my last EP was uh, called Black Magic, which my company is named after. Um, and it was a five song EP and I wanted to do music videos that, um, were basically like one storyline that follow all five of those songs. And what I planned to do was shoot five music videos that all culminated in one story and then release them over a span of five weeks. Okay. Right. I realized how much money that was going to take and that wasn't a possibility. <laughs> so, um, I actually ended up connecting with Sean Mathis, um, who's now one of my writing partners and, and, and a very, very, bro like a brother to me. And Sean was the first person that I had pitched this idea to. Um, and I had met him five years prior at a festival, like a, a natural hair festival that I was performing at. And he's like, yo, I just moved to Atlanta. I direct films. I'm like, oh, cool, that's what's up. He's like, man, I really like your music, man. Keep doing what you're doing. 
And we kept in touch with each other on Instagram, but had never really met after that. And when I started thinking about, okay, how do I make something like this? Because this is like a, this is like a story. This is like a film. I don't know what I'm doing. He immediately came into my mind. So I just hit him up on Instagram, like, yo, I got this idea. Do you mind meeting me for coffee? And, you know, I, I'll just, I, I'll try to sell you on it and see if you're interested. He's like, all right, cool. So like, I had my whole little paper set up where it was like each song was the lyrics of the song on the left-hand side. On the right was the story that I wanted to see lined up with the words. And I'm playing him the music he's got on the headphones. And then I'm pausing the music and be like, and then this is gonna happen on the story. And then that's gonna happen. And then I hit play again. Right. And he's like bobbing his head. He's like, wait, 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 bro. Don't say nothing else. I'm in like whatever this is, this is, is I'm in. And I'm like, all right, so what now? And he's like, well, how much, how much is it going to cost? I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know how to, he's like, well, if I waive my fee and I get my company, yada, 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 it's going to cost this much. And I'm like, I definitely ain't got that much money. <laughs> but I'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll figure it out. I'll right? figure like, it out. All right, cool. And I figured it out. I went to Kickstarter, started crowdfunding. Um, I was going to an acting school at the time. I got people from the acting school to donate. Uh, one of my mentors, Greg Allen Williams, he donated a big chunk of money for us to actually go and do this. And we ended up shooting a 19 minute short film that was five locations, over 30 cast and crew. And we did it in 10 hours. And he turned to me at the end of that day and he said, you're the best producer I've ever worked with. And I said, what are you talking about? He's like, bro, you got all these people here. You close on all these locations. You wrote the story. You found the team. He's like, you, you coordinated the scheduling. You even had background. You made signs for the background for the protesting. I've never worked with anybody that's prepared. And I was like, oh shit, that's producing. This is easy. I've been doing this the whole damn time. I'm just time. about to say, you just, the whole story this is just all your experiences culminated. Everything. Everything. Every, I've, I've done this. Like I already, I had Black Magic merch before the, before the, the album even dropped. I had the store up online already. Like this is, I'm like, this is easy. I've been like, this is nothing. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if I can go to school for this. So I started looking up film schools and, and different programs, USC, New York Film Academy. And I, I kind of settled on New York Film Academy and I reached out to a friend of mine from undergrad named the Boyce of Sean. And I was like, hey, I'm thinking about going to film school because I knew he had gone for directing. And I, I want to go to New York Film Academy. Will you write me a recommendation letter? And he was like, yeah, bro, that's cool. But I went to AFI. I'm like, what the fuck is AFI? He's like, yo, send me that film that you have been working on. I've been meaning to take a look at it, but I kind of got a little busy and, you know, some things happened. And he's like, but yeah, I'll I, I, I help you out for sure. I'm like, all right, cool. Send him the film. He called me back 10 minutes later and said, what the fuck are you doing? He said, you better not go to New York film. You better not go anywhere but where I went. I'll write your recommendation letter, walk you through the application process. He's like, they are looking for people like you. And I was like, people looking for me? Because mind you, I have been doing music looking for people. Right. Right? I have been looking for people who wanted somebody like me. And now he's telling me they've been looking, looking for me. For and I'm like, I've been here. I've been here. Like, I just didn't know that this was, you know, an opportunity for me. So I applied, um, ended up getting an interview. Uh, I, was, I was interviewing for not only entry, but a full ride scholarship. So I was like, I, I can't do this over Zoom. So I actually flew to LA, flew to Hollywood, interviewed with them in person. And when I got there in the school, it wasn't until I stepped foot in the Warner Brothers building on campus and I saw Sidney Portier accepting the AFI mm -hmm. Lifetime Achievement Award. I saw Robert De Niro, Meryl Streep. I'm seeing all these people on the wall and I'm like, oh shit, I am not prepared for this at all. Like, it's no way, it's no way they've been looking for me. I don't even know what I'm doing here right now. Like, I'm just, I just like making stuff. Like, that's it. But in the interview, I remember they asked me, they're like, why are you going for producing instead of for directing? Like, the voice went. 
And I told him, I said, because I'm black, nobody's ever going to give me money to do the things that I want to do. And I learned that firsthand. So I'd rather you show me how to get the money and what to do with it than tell me I need you to find a voice as a creative because I already got that voice. Wow. And that moment was the moment they accepted me. And when I got to campus, I started realizing that everybody felt like an imposter. It was kids that had been wanting to go to AFI their whole life. And I had just figured out what it was four months ago. Wow. You know what I mean? And it's like, everybody's like, I don't belong here. This is the most prestigious school in the world. I don't. And I'm like, okay, so what? Like, I'm here now, you know? And it was, um, we had a class where one of the professors has shown this, um, this short film. And it was like this weird avant-garde film. And I tell the story all the time, but I had never, I never understood what the film was trying to do. Like, it was like, black and white and it was some girl singing into a fan and then she was doing something over here and then it was like incest over here I'm like I don't know what this is and I remember the teacher asking us like what do we think of the film and everybody's giving like this critical analysis with all this film jargon and shit that I have no idea what any of it means and I'm just like should I raise my hand no nah, I don't say nothing should I Hey, yeah, sure, you. I have no idea what this thing is. I have no idea. I, I, it film for me is about a conversation. It's about communication. And I have no idea what this person was trying to say to me. And the teacher said, that's fair. Thank you. We get out on break in the hallway. I had about 15 people come up to me. It's like, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I didn't get that uh, shit neither. Right. And I said, <laughs> oh, all oh, y'all scared. Oh, y'all scared. Okay. Okay, cool. I can work with this. You know what I mean? Like I can, I can, I can leverage my experience, my opinion, and my artistic merit based off of actually being a, a creative and not just going to school and learning theory, but I've been doing this for over 12 years on my own. You know what I'm saying? Like I have certain things that y'all don't have. And at every chance that I get, I'm gonna leverage all of that. Absolutely. So my first cycle film created a poster, put posters up around the school. They're like, what are you doing? So I'm doing what I always do. As soon as after that, after that film, when I did all the posters and everything for ours, everybody started wanting to do posters every semester. And I'm like, okay, cool, it's working. You know what I mean? And I just kept doing that. Like I just apply everything I learned from hip hop, um, creating the merchandise for my thesis film as a fundraising opportunity. Um, doing these uh, Instagram uh, accounts for each film to, to garner attention. You know what I'm saying? Talking to everybody about every project that I wanted to do, not just the projects that I was currently working on. Like those were the things that I knew to do from music. And I just took it and ran with it at I every love step. It. Listen, Ooh, you, you don't realize how much you unpacked in there. One, Okay, where do I even begin? I, I want to start with the authenticity, being authentically you. Within that, yeah, there's yeah. so much waiting to be tapped in. When you stay to being authentic, one, in that interview, I'm just going to say what it is, right? You said, okay, I feel this. I'm looking. It made me feel yeah. overwhelmed. I'm going to go on this interview and just say what I felt. You stay authentic. And that is what they were waiting for. While we trying to be someone yeah. else, yep. be something else, yep. There's a lot of denial in that. When we stay true to our authentic self, there's something already created, a spot and a space created for who we mm -hmm. are created to be. And that's what you just spoke mm -hmm. to when you stay authentic in the interview, when you stay authentic in that class. I mean, you fought mm -hmm. against the imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. You fought, you know, it was there. It was an internal war. And then authentic, you said, I'm pushing through. I'm gonna raise my hand and not try to pretend I know or try to sound like the rest of everybody I just heard. I'm just gonna say, I don't know what the hell I just saw. Mm, and when you no stay, idea. no idea. And when you stay authentic <laughs> to that, so many people even looked up to you. Amazing people, because they're part of that yeah. school too. Yeah. So now you just paved and blazed a path of how people see who Duran is just by mm -hmm. stepping up and being authentic. So I want to point out that. Another thing, I want to go all the way back to you said, I don't know how, but I'm going to figure it out. You said that when you yeah. moved for your to, towards the internship and the job said, I'm not going to be able to do whatever. You said, I don't know, mm -hmm. I'm leaving. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to figure it out. You said it with mm -hmm. this situ situation. You said it with uh, Sean. 
with, um, you know, him producing. I don't know. I don't ha- I'm gonna figure it out. That's the one thing that we have to step into too. Um, yeah. When you stay, when you go inside, we move away from fear and doubt to strength and power. And it sounds easier said than done, but when you do it, when it's in you, you do figure it out. If this is mm-hmm. something that's really within you, you'll figure it out and you did. Yeah. So I don't want us, yeah. us to move past what you just said, you made it happen. <laughs> but also I don't want to move past something I think is even bigger. One, you getting with Sean, like you said, you said this yourself, that um, filmmaking is about working with um, incredible people. And so you've put mm-hmm. yourself, one, you're incredible. Then you put yourself around people that um, are Thank incredible you. and who recognize that you were incredible. But when you brought up, when you sat down with Sean and you showed him the song with the script, the song with the script, you know what that my mind immediately went to was all the hype that's around the harder they fall, the writer and mm-hmm. producer, mm-hmm. and them saying, you know, Same him same. doing something yeah. new and creative. And, you know, yeah. he's bringing this thing where, you know, putting the song with the, but people are always doing there's someone out there already doing it. They don't have, maybe mm-hmm. not have that platform yet. But when you said you did that back then, you were already looking at song, script, lining it up. I was like, yo, mm-hmm. that's dope. And I just read this when I'm listening to this producer writer saying, oh, I'm doing something new. Well, no, you had the platform to introduce it to the world in the way you did first, but you had someone who already had a create creative yeah. genius brain yeah. that was doing it. Uh, and I, I, I I'm, Man, I gotta meet that brother, and I will meet that brother one day. But like yes, he, you will. he, to his attention, he he had done the same, right? He had been writing that script for over ten years. Yeah, before read that anybody too. hopped on board, you know what I mean. And he was making music as the bullets, knowing that he wanted to write this western. Like he he, it was already in him. We were on kind of the same kind of wavelength, wavelength in our thinking yes. in terms of. What can I do um, in this particular moment? And I think what a lot of people don't understand is like, even when you're saying like, I don't know, I'll figure it out, right? What people always look at in those moments is what they don't have and what they can't do. They don't look at what they can do. Like, I didn't know how to write a script, right? So the format that I had where it was the lyrics from the song on the left side and then the images that I wanted to see on the right side, that's the format from broadcast journalism. When reporters write stories, they have the voiceover, the VO on the left side, and then on the right side, they'll block it out with the images that they've captured. So you can hand that to the editor and say, hey, cut it, cut it like this, right? So at this moment, when I say this line, I want you to cut to this image. Okay. At this moment, when I say this line, you cut to this image. That was not the average structure of a script or how to tell a story, but it's the only structure that I had. Okay. It's what I knew. And it's how I had outlined all of my music videos to that point. So when I gave it to Sean, he's like, oh, I see exactly what this is as a director. Like you, you're giving me the images and the work. Oh, okay, cool. He had never seen it in that format either. You know what I mean? So it was just, it was communication. It was, how can I get people to see what I'm saying, utilizing what, with the, 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 utilizing the tools that I have to be able to do that. And instead of looking at what I didn't have, it was like, all right, well, what can I do? You know, even with raising money, it's like, I don't have the money. How can I raise the money? Shit, make dope content and beg. <laughs> like, I can do that. I can go online and put up an Instagram post. I know if I've got 2000 followers on Instagram and the budget's 2,500, if I get each of them to just give me a damn dollar, I can make this film in the next month. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know how to talk to people. So I'll go out and do that. Um, I've got all these CDs that I've already pressed up. So maybe I can just, you know, uh, the first person, the first 10 people that donate, hey, I'll, I'll mail you a free CD. Like whatever it was that I could do, I did it. You know, um, offering people merchandise. If you donate over $50, you'll get a t-shirt with it. I had the t-shirts in my garage already. You know what I'm saying? I already spent the money. So, okay, cool. Let's use it. And you just keep reading up. You read up as much as possible and, and, until you find out what clicks and what works. But how do you get that? Like you said, you focus on, don't focus on what you don't have or can't do. Focus on what you do have and can do. But how do you even get that mindset? Like that mindset 
you were able to scan the things that you did have and then assess what you can do. How did you even look at it that way? How did you break down and even say, I have these Twitter follows, I'm gonna do this with it. Like what, what is something that pushed you towards even being able to process it like that though? I think it's, it's, it's my upbringing. Um, my father, um, Joel Jones, who's actually legally my stepfather, but he's, he's been like the only father in my life since I was six years old. Um, he's a very like no excuse, don't quit type of person. Even though when I was a, quit, a kid, I quit every goddamn sport there was because I just, I knew I wasn't about to be no athlete. I just like playing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so like, give me the basketball, let me shoot. Don't tell me to run a hundred suicides. I'm not doing that shit. Like, I just can't. <laughs> so uh, I ain't cut from that cloth. Like, so it, with him, it, I always saw him as a person that never made excuses. Right. And I would come to him like, Hey dad, like for my car, I want to put these subwoofers in the back, but the boxes cost this much. And he's like, let me see it. Look at the magazine. All we need is some some plywood from Home Depot. We need this. Give me some glue. Get this out the shed. We'll make it. All right, cool. He always looked at what he could do, not at what he didn't have. Okay. And he made it. He made me my first subwoofer box that was in the backseat of that 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 eighty seven uh, <laughs> Honda Civic hatchback. Right. Like he made it with his bare hands. You know what I'm saying? When I wanted to follow Fast and Furious and put a body kit on my car. He's like, hey, go on that, go on that thing. What's the what's the thing on the internet? I said, Google. He said, yeah, go search on Google, figure out where you can buy it from, and then we'll install it. All right, cool. He installed the body kit on the car. Never had uh, done it before. Like, and I just saw him create out of having to, not out of what he didn't have. Right. You know what I'm saying? He never Tapping thought in. about it that way. You know what I'm saying? He never said, oh, I can't, I can't do it because I don't have the money and I don't have the expertise. He's like, I learned this shit. Ain't nothing but picking up a book. Got it. And that's, that's where I got it from. And then that means those um, who don't, what you need to do is surround yourself around people that can help you think out the box. You can dump in front of them. This is what I know. Can you help me to assess how to do? The only thing is the one thing that you took from that situation wasn't just learning that you can assess and see what you do have and make it happen. You also took, I have to take the action. That's where most of us have to look too. Even if you surround yourself around people and you can show them this, when people say, oh, I see you able to do this. Sometimes you have to just be, well, I can say sometimes you have to be willing to take the action. If somebody step in and help you, great. Sure. Sure. But you have to be able to invest in yourself. So that's good that you took that action. I want to go into like I said, you said, uh, you know, telling our stories our way, racial issues. You brought up so many things. You've been on CNN before. You talked about Trayvon Martin. Look, you was all look all polished journalist, bro. That's like <laughs> your background all with that the whole situation you know, on CNN. But you also shot a film dealing with that too, with black under Black Magic. At that mm-hmm. time, um, can you talk a little bit about this content that you're choosing to to? curate and put out um even starting with that one was that one of the five of the if i recall correctly was that one of the five yeah yeah so what so what happened with that it was supposed to be that black magic project was supposed to be five separate music videos but when we finished shooting at the end of the day we realized we didn't have everything in the can to make it five separate so i was like well why don't we just make it a short film and i'm like i don't know what that is but if you can make it happen sure you know what I'm saying? And we made it one cohesive film. And I was like, oh, this is pretty dope. And yeah. he's like, yeah, what you want to do with it? I'm like, all right, well, we can just put it out and, you know, pub the album. He's like, man, you should submit it to film festivals. Again, what the fuck is a film festival? He was like, I'll walk you through the whole process, figure it out. 25 submissions later, we got into seven and one six. What does that look like? Just, go back to film, because some people listening may not, just like you, they may be in that space. Well, you was at what the heck is that? What does that look like? Talking about cost. What is what is that? What is that that process? Each 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 festival. There's a, a website called FilmFreeway.com where you upload and you kind of have a profile page for your film, and it gives you a list of festivals 
like global festivals, some international, you know, you got Sundance, South by Southwest, you got all these different festivals on there, Athens, River Run, um, Tribeca, TIFF, all large festivals. And then you've got some smaller tier festivals and then you've got some test festivals below that. And each one has an application fee, right? And Sean basically walked me through that on his website and I'm like, okay, cool. So which one should we apply to? And he's like, well, look at the ones that are centered around music. Look at the ones that are regional and in this region that you want to go to. And I'm like, oh, perfect. This is like marketing. You know what I'm saying? Because hip hop, it all starts regional. First, you want to be the dopest in your in your school or the, or the dopest on your block. Then you want to be the dopest in your county, the right. dopest in your city, the dopest in your state. And you just want to push it. Right. So we started with Atlanta Film Festival since we were in Atlanta, submitted to as many of those as possible. I'm like, all right, where am I from? Well, let's, let's, let's submit to Maryland. Right. Let's submit to Maryland since I know I got friends and family in there. Let's submit to, to Florida since I know Miami is kind of popping and I'd love to take a vacation to Miami. Like whatever, whatever it is. Right. And basically through working, every time I had some money to kick, whether it was fifty dollars, sixty dollars, twenty five dollars, fifteen for the submission fees, I submitted to another festival, you know, before I bought a, a nice pair of shoes or, mm. or anything, I submitted to a festival. You know, it's that sacrifice. This is that common denominator. Uh, Sean also did an interview as well. And one of the things he was saying too, I'm a sneakerhead. And I had to realize, do I get these Jordans or yeah. do I do yeah. this? You know, and, and like we had said, yeah. when you put yourself in a position, you can get all that stuff that you want without even thinking twice about it. Get your stuff in that position. So you have to make those sacrifices to get there where the expendable income that you now create and have and you create a then it's great. But right now you're funding somebody else's situation before you fund your situation. Exactly. Um, so you exactly. have to just that, that rethinking that, you know, flipping the mind uh, from cultural condition on, we have to present ourselves because perception is everything. We have to present ourselves that feel like we have achieved instead of really sacrificing and putting it into achieving whatever your goal yeah. is. So we have yeah. to really, really flip that. So you said, speaking of which, so now I want to go to, um, <laughs> I have this on for a reason. Um, I will talk a little bit about five, talking about film festivals. And then also what, Daywalker, like kind of where are you at yeah, right now? Yeah. What you got going on? Well, right now, five is, uh, it was my thesis film. There is my thesis film from AFI. Um, it's, it's loosely inspired by my brother. Uh, my brother's incarcerated and converted to Islam. So the story is about a young man who at the age of 16, um, he, he does a crime, which you figure out in the film, and he goes away for seven years. And in that seven years, he converts to Islam and comes back with this new um, sense of self to his neighborhood. But he's trying to win the forgiveness of his mother for the crime that he committed, right? And what he learns through that, the hope and the consistency is, the forgiveness that I seek, I eventually have to give it to myself first. Mm. You know, it's not, I can't control whether somebody else gives it to me or not. The only thing I can do is show up consistently, right? Um, and we wrote a film around that and it was, it was a lot of, it was the biggest project I had done to date, right? Like the, the film that I told you about Black Magic, it was a $2,000 budget that we shot in one day. We had 10 hours to do it, 30 people, yada, 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 five locations. This film was a six day shoot, probably about 50 cast, 15 or no, 15 cast, 50 crew, um, trucks, um, six different locations, one of which is a prison that was outside of the 30 mile, like all this stuff that I learned. And every time I sat down to do the budget with my professors, it was like 60,000, 70,000. And I'm like, God dang, how the hell are we gonna do this? And it was that same mindset. I'll figure of, it out. I don't know. I'll figure it out. And we figured it out, you know? Um, and merch was one of the ways that we did that. And everybody asked me like, well, how much money did you make off the merch? And I was like, it wasn't about the money we made off the merch, right? We, we marketed ourselves in a way yes. that you saw it as something polished that you wanted to be a part of. So even when people would wear the merchandise, people around my school was like, oh, I want one. That's okay, right. cool. Hit the website. Hit the website, buy a t-shirt. You know, and it wasn't about, all right, how much did you get off of each t-shirt sold? Because I think all in all, we probably raised about $1,000 off of merchandise. But that other 68, 
came off of people seeing the merchandise, the merchandise being promoted, you know what I mean? Other people talking about it. And it was just the word of mouth started to spread. So people wanted to be a part of the thing. Absolutely. And wear the merchandise as a badge of honor saying, Absolutely. yeah, I'm, I'm a part of something that you don't know about, you know? And it was that, that thing that came out of the hip hop mindset, you know, when she, two chains did the, the shirts with the two chains. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Perfect. And people are like, what is that? Oh, you don't know about it. Don't worry about it. Absolutely. Like you feel like you're a part of something and, and we needed people to feel like they were a part of it. So um, Five Now is actually set to premiere at the Toronto Black Film Festival on the 16th. Um, it's a virtual festival. So make sure you check, check out Toronto Black Film Festival and get your tickets for that. Um, another short film that I did called Hallelujah, which actually came before my thesis film, just premiered at Sundance. Um, that one we have a feature attached to called the incredible heist of hallelujah Jones that we're actually looking for production companies to help us fund, um, and post and hopefully shoot within the next year or so. Um, and that script was in the Sundance lab as well. So a, a lot of these things just came out of hustling, networking with people and just using that mindset of I'll figure it out and actually doing it, you know, and, and showing up and putting your money where your mouth is. Um, Daywalker right now, I'm pitching to different yep. networks. Yep. I have a manager that I'm that's helping me with that. I got a documentary I'm working on called Legacy. I've got two producers that are, are down with me to, to, to make that happen that I'll, I'll hopefully be able to talk about soon. Um, it's just so many things, but all of these ideas that I had before even coming to film school were things that I wanted to do. And I just used film school. I used the two years that I had not, not needing to work or not being able to work, use those, the debt from my student loans yeah. to be able to fund certain things, start my company and do all those things. And it's just reinvesting in yourself, you know, um, and it's, it's starting to pay off in, in multiple ways. Strategic, like you said, strategic, strategic yeah. and uh, driven. You don't see no other, you don't see plan B. It's, this is, if you plan on succeeding in whatever you say, there's no reason to even think of plan B, right? Because that, that's, that's, that's strange. I, I plan to succeed. I don't, I, don't, I don't see that. I can't. Only if I feel myself going that way would I even say, oh, this is plan B. But I don't see that in the beginning. But the, I do want to go back to Black Magic was a, loosely based on the uh, Tamar Rice situation as well, because you kind of talked yeah. about like how five, I want to talk about how you're bringing these impactful and powerful stories. Like what's that backstory? So Black Magic that we brought up before, was yeah. um, based around that uh, Tamar Rice uh, situation as well. What was yeah. it when we went and we filmed and you um, cut your uh, locks uh, on? That was Bossy, Bossy Niende, um, let go. That let go. I had my locks, yeah. I, I had been growing my hair since I was basically in ninth grade. I hadn't had a haircut in over 15 years when I did that video. And um, I realized that you know, people talk about the energy that's kept in your locks and in your hair and how it's a source of power, a source of strength and all the rest of these things. But what they also don't tell you is that not all energy is good energy. That's right. Right. And right. I started to, um, I felt like I was in a position in my life where I was coveting the hair, right? It was a certain image that I had created for myself and um, something that I was holding on to that it wasn't serving me anymore. Right. I was spending so much time concentrating on it and try to use that to, um, you know, do whatever it was like. It was like a, it was almost like a status symbol for me. Mm. And I don't like. I don't like fearing things and and anybody with hair or long hair will tell you I have nightmares about somebody cutting my hair. Mm. Right. And the moment that that started to happen, I'm like nah this shit ah. has to go it has to go like I can't be holding on to something like this and having to have that type of control over me that over I'm literally in my sleep fearing it not being there I'm like nah this ain't it so I started growing it out and I'd always always said like if you ever cut it you better make some type of art with it Ooh, you know it? so I I reached out to a friend of mine named Lurch who, who was my first barber when I cut my hair and he was like, yeah, man, I, I cut out of this art gallery that, you know, is my spot and you can shoot the video here. We'll cut you up. We'll do all of that. And I'm like, all right, cool. You know, so I got my homeboy, Dave, who um, Dave is a, is a dope ass cinematographer. But Dave is like me he's from Philly. He a hustler. 
you know. Um, so we kind of cut from the same cloth and, and he was working with drones and he knew how to shoot videos. And I'm like, all right, cool, I know how to edit. So we did that and, and we made a, a short with the song talks about me cutting my hair. And it was, um, it was just this whole experience of, of letting go of the old and, and, and doing something new and, and changing. Um, and I started to see my confidence. Everything started to shift in a different direction. Like I, when I wasn't holding on to that thing anymore, it was like, yeah. it almost was like I finally saw myself, yeah, right? I had a line that. in the song where it was like, um, it's like knowing you a superhero, but spending hours on your cape, like the powers in your cape. Mm. Mm. And it was like, it was like I spent so much time on my hair and like, you know, getting it retwisted up. And I got to, you know, I got to style on him and do this, that, and the third. And at a certain part in the show, you know what, I'm going I'm to take it down. And I'm going to let it flow and do that. And I'm going to, and it was like, this is stupid. This is stupid. You know, like I, I'm, I'm out here looking like a whole dummy, <laughs> like not realizing that I am the power. You are. You know what I'm saying? Power. Yes. I am the power. So I, I took that back. Um, but to your question about Black Magic, um, Black Magic was loosely based off of Tamir Rice. Um, I did a song years prior when Trayvon Martin was killed called Skittles in Arizona, which landed me an interview on CNN. And I think um, a lot of these, the art that I do was about our stories and um, our pain, our joy. Um, and just who we are as people. And like I said, I had fought so long not to be boxed in. And um, that's where the box around Black Magic comes from because mm -hmm. what I realized, instead of fighting so hard to get out of the box, is to realize the power that's actually inside of the box, mm -hmm. right? Because as Black people, we've been the biggest import and the biggest, biggest export in this entire society since we got here. They've always been wanting to play in our box, whether it's getting tans like us or wanting to wear braids like us or talk like us or walk like us. They've always wanted to be in our box. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I, I really had to think about that and sit with that. And I had people ask me like, oh man, you never want to be boxed in. I'm like, yeah, the fuck I do. I do. Because this box is where all my magic is right here. Wow. My people, what we've been doing forever, this box that we in right here, this is our box. They can't take that from us. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can come if we allow you, right? But you're not about to take it, you know? And that's that's where my entire mindset came from about telling stories and just um, going back to the intention that I set for myself early on. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, what's the message you want to give to people? And I'm happy because I, I'm happy that you're finding the power not finding the power, you're finding that you are the power within the box. You are the power within any space that you occupy and that you're choosing to tell these empowering stories because even when yeah. you're looking at um, those that are in the Black culture and stuff, a lot of times we speak as if we proud about or self-love, but our mm -hmm. actions show the opposite. Um, shows that we also are trying, a lot of us are, you know, to attach and to do things that is in opposition of what we say we want, right? Um, but sure, so hearing these sure. empowering stories continues to teach and um, hopefully inject though that self-love and things that you can see and you taking it from a different perspective saying, hey, you don't have to jump out of here because everybody wants mm -hmm. to actually come play in the sandbox that you're trying to jump yep. out of. Yep. You're, you're thinking that dirt is better than the golden sand that you have. So you're, you're teaching and you're, I love what you're doing um, uh, through your uh, stories as well. So Thank you. there was something Thank I was you. about to, um, oh, I know I was going to ask you. So yes, I know you said you finished those donations. Are there things still open for people to be able to continue? Like you just said, you have more production in, in the works. Are there, are there platforms? We can still get the merch. I don't know if you can see the back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it all. <laughs> Yeah, so is there, I mean, they can still get the merch. They can still, is there other ways um, people can continue? Because listen, we need to put our action and money and everything else where our mouth is um, to support people that's doing things that you're doing. And if you're doing it, you want to support people that's doing it because that's how that energy, we talked sure. about energy, how it's sure. circulating around and you never know what position you help to put someone in 
that continues to pull. Like you said, you're looking forward mm-hmm. to meeting the writer and producer from Harder to Fall, and that's how it happened. So is mm-hmm. there anything mm-hmm. that is still open for us to? Um, just my Instagram. You know, go to my Instagram. You, you can hit the link in my bio to find out more information, but just follow. Like I put everything as much as possible there. Um, right now we are pivoting into, you know, a space where I don't have to lean on the community that I want to serve in order to fund the projects that I want to fund, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed to be in this new That's position good. where, you know, um, I'm not having to ask the people who, need these stories to yeah. fund these stories and and that's always been the goal you know i can actually start creating jobs for those people wow. instead of asking nice. them like hey can you give me 50 dollars?" you know um we we for my thesis film we went on a location scout at one point in south central um and we actually ended up not using this house but i remember the guy came out he's like hey my, my daughter is interested in, in in working on film like do you think she can, I said, yo, here, take my number. She can come in PA, you know, um, she can come in PA whenever she wanted to. Um, now, because of COVID, we weren't able to do that because she was a minor. But yeah. at that time, it was like, if I got an opportunity to bring people from this neighborhood and expose them to things that I felt like I should have been exposed to and I didn't get an opportunity to, like, I'm going to shoot where we are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to tell our stories. I'm going to put us in a position to see that we can actually do these things, right? Like one of the things I'm most proud of is every set that I've been on has been so diverse culturally. It's black and brown people all together. It's white people. It's LGBTQIA. It's everything, you know? And I, I remember at the, um, the premiere for Five, I had everybody stand up and it literally was like, Harry Belafonte, Rainbow Coalition, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, wow. we had a, a, our our composer is Pratik Rajagopal from Mumbai and uh, Alexandra Kalinowski. Um, My director is David Arante, who's a, a Chicano kid from the Valley out here. My cinematographer is Dawit Adira, Ethiopian guy. Um, that's It's first generation here. And like my editor is, is Eric Osman. He's a Jewish kid from New Jersey. Like these are the types of stories. They're rallying around these stories, not necessarily around what the stories can give them, but because they feel like these things are important. You know what I'm saying? So I finally, I found that tribe of people and that's, that's what I've always needed. You know, and, and once I had that, it's like, all right, we can pivot and we can start to make some other things once people see that what we're doing is a value, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think follow the Instagram, I am Duran, E-Y-E-A-M-D-U-R-A-N. And you'll see everything there. You'll see okay. everything there. And I'm gonna add a tag onto something Duran says. So like he said, uh, thankfully he's in a position where he doesn't have to depend on the individuals that these type of uh, this type of content is made for, but, he doesn't need to, but we want you to be involved because you involving yourself in it, if you involving yourself in it, like he said, even having merch, it's a badge of honor. It's a, it helps on other levels. It's bigger than the money. It's being a part mm-hmm. of the process, a part of a process that you are now saying, not just to Duran, but you're saying to yourself that um, I'm sold out. I'm buying in into us collectively moving into a different direction with ownership and um, just being able to lead, control, and tell our stories. So it's not an, a matter of needing anything to happen. We want, and it's the same thing. I'm blessed to be in the position I am in all the platforms I have. I don't need to do anything, but I want to do it. And I want you to be a part of it because that helps us. That's medicine. That helps us to now cure some of the things that have been injected in us and, and to see us to move forward. So please connect with Duran mm-hmm. on IG, um, especially if the stories that are being told are empowering you, please uh, do so. Oh man, I, I appreciate you. Um, listen, your story with the nuggets that you gave in it that was able to be extracted from it, um, your you. resiliency, everything. That's what you exude even through this camera is going to be an amazing deposit 
on a lot of listeners and a lot of viewers. Um, I appreciate you so much for your time, Duran. I worked with you personally. So I know some of this stuff that sure. you're saying is sure. not something that's fabricated. When he says, I'll figure it out, we had to go through a whole licensing situation that was a beast, <laughs> a beast. <laughs> Um, yeah. with the light. Yeah. And he still, he plugged through as much as we can with this and with that and was figuring it out. So this is someone who's authentic through and through. And I'm excited um, to know him and excited to see where he's actually going to go. And I highly encourage you to connect with someone like this so that you can be a part of that synergy to move forward. Thank you so much. Love it, man. And Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is, this is a blessing right here for sure. Last question Thanks. before people go out. If you were a superhero, yeah. talking about that cape, not superhero, a superhero, and you can mm. change one thing, one thing in this world, that's your power, what would it be? If I could change one thing. Yeah, um, that's your superpower. I would make people believe. Mm. I make people believe um, in themselves and not other things. Beautiful. Yeah, that would be my power. If we receive it, that's what's important. Sure. You once you do that, it fix everything else aligns. All yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you for listening to another segment of Conversate and Elevate. Where we brought you another, I mean, a meal, a full meal. So make sure you're working <laughs> out, you're doing all the things you need to do because you're going to be full from all of this sure. um, information sure. <laughs> that's being brought. Um, and until next time, elevators continue to go.